This week, you're seeing prices of them both surge to, to record levels, and you're finding shortages and in low inventories in places like Europe and China. A global power crisis. Energy prices surge by thousands of percentage points from China to Europe. What's causing these drastic increases, and how will they impact the global economy? I spent this morning uh, on the radio listening to people calling in in tears in despair because they don't know how they're going to pay the bills. They don't know how they're going to be able to buy their children a Christmas present. How is the price crunch affecting the most vulnerable? We investigate and speak to the CEO of UK utility, Ecotricity. They're forcing these companies out of business because they've imposed the price cap. So they're forcing companies now to sell gas and power for less than they can buy it for, which is forcing them bankrupt. And from subsea cables to giant battery arrays, what are the green solutions to preventing this from happening again? I'm Kaylee Lines from Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York, and this is Bloomberg Green. The world is in the grip of an energy crisis. From China to Europe and even Brazil, the cost of energy is soaring. Natural gas prices haven't doubled or tripled or even quadrupled. They are currently sitting between 10 and 20 times higher than their lows in spring 2020. And scientists and economists are warning that this could be the first of many power crunches in the clean power transition. But what's causing it? Our reporter Dan Murtaugh explains. <laughs> Right now, Europe and China are both facing power crises, and while there's slight differences in why, there's two main overriding reasons behind both, and that is a really strong demand recovery from the pandemic and a shortage of two key power producing fuels, natural gas and coal. Now, on the demand side, industries recovered much faster than societies at large from the pandemic. Factories have been running full steam now for, uh, for almost a year. Uh, part of that is because of government stimulus providing capital for big infrastructure projects and the like. Part of it is just a sort of pent up demand that, that built up during the pandemic when people and companies alike put off big purchases or big investments because of the uncertainty. And then when things started to get back to normal, they went out on a splurge and bought. And so all these factory orders came in at the same time. And so you've seen big demand recovery. Unfortunately, production of fuels like natural gas and coal haven't picked up at the same pace as that demand recovery. So you're seeing prices of them both surge to, to record levels, and you're finding shortages in low inventories in places like Europe and China, leading to uh, fears of power curves. So right now, there are sort of two things going on in China. One is you have certain provinces that don't have enough coal to run their power generators, and they're having uh, blackouts and they're telling factories to shut down for multiple times uh, or multiple days a week. And then on the other side, you have emission controls as part of the government's long-term climate goals, and they're trying to reduce the amount of energy used by heavy factories. And so they've asked them to shut down. So both sides, less industrial production and possible uh, disruption to global supply chains. Absolutely. They, they picked the wrong time to do it, you know, basically in the middle of the pandemic last year. They had never uh, a thought that they would be out of coal. And so now, you know, Australia used to be one of their top coal suppliers. They haven't imported a single rock of the fuel from the country in more than a year. Uh, and now that they're, you know, facing supply shortages, they could really use, you know, uh, supply from anywhere they could get it. countries are taking different approaches. Uh, for example, in Europe, Greece has uh, offered to subsidize power prices for people. Spain is threatening a windfall tax on uh, utilities that are going to be reaping in big amounts of money for high power prices. And, and Poland has asked the entire EU to reconsider its green push amid these really high costs as we're heading into winter. Now let's speak to our reporters around the world about how the energy crisis is impacting their regions. Our chief Asia economics correspondent Enda Curran joins us from Hong Kong and energy reporters Todd Gillespie and Peter Muller join us from London and Rio respectively. So Enda, let's start with you. China recovered quite quickly, but there hasn't been enough oil and gas. What are the implications for China's economy and already existing supply chain issues? 
Well, the energy crunch, Kaylee, is expected to have a bigger hit than even the initial lockdown to control the pandemic when it first began in early 2020. The real issue is that this crunch is impacting the production side of the economy. So the manufacturers and the exporters who have really driven China's export boom since the pandemic began, they're going to feel the pain this time because their production is being curbed. I speak to manufacturers who tell me that they're only being allowed to operate, say, three days a week rather than a full week. That's going to impact supply chains. That's going to impact their ability to meet orders. So you're talking then about a hit to the production side. At the same time as the consumer and the service side of China's economy is somewhat weak because of ongoing fragility in the wake of the pandemic. And when you put it all together, economists say it's going to have a material hit on China's economy. It's going to have a spillover effect on global supply chains. And it probably does put question marks now about the durability of China's rebound since the pandemic began, which you described at the start. It has been a V-shaped rebound, but people now are saying it'll be something much slower than that heading into the end of the year. All right, so that's the picture in China and in Asia. Let's pivot over to Europe now with Todd Gillespie. So, Todd, prices have absolutely skyrocketed. What are the implications both for the continent and for the U.K.? Yeah, absolutely, Kaylee. I mean, today I spoke to someone who compared the rally in gas futures to Dogecoin, the uh, infamous <laughs> cryptocurrency, which has basically gone to the moon. So you could basically say gas and power prices are doing the same now. Uh, the implications really for the political sphere are quite big, too. You've got governments stepping in to um, essentially subsidize gas prices so fertilizer factories can reopen, um, so, uh, so food production can keep going. Uh, you've also got a huge... Uh, huge sort of uh, uh, worry about the impact on consumers in the long run. You've got energy suppliers um, essentially going bust in the UK. And then you now have the EU also coming out and basically saying, look, we need a total restructuring of the market here. Uh, we really need to, to, to intervene to make sure that manufacturing can continue as planned, um, that people especially who are now working from home more after, you know, after lockdowns, uh, who are more vulnerable to high energy prices uh, as a result. Um, this, this, you know, to, to sort of protect this shock uh, uh, covering the entire uh, economy, uh, consumers and businesses as well. And Peter, this crisis is no longer just limited to Europe and Asia. What's the knock-on effect in Latin America? Yes, the problem here is, is that we're in the middle of a water crisis. Um, the amount of water flowing into hydroelectric reservoirs here in Brazil is at the, the lowest in about a century. And so they're having to rely on natural gas and you know, coal and fuel oil to, to, make up, to make up for that mix. And so they're using all these thermal plants to try and compensate. And that's leading to inflation. And it's you know, a huge headache for President Bolsonaro as he moves into his election next year because um, – you know, inflation is affecting the population right now and it's affecting its popularity. All right. Thank you so much to all of our reporters around the world. Peter Mullard in Rio, Todd Gillespie in London and our Enda Curran in Hong Kong. Thank you all so much. And coming up on the rest of the program, we'll dig down into how the UK's energy crisis is affecting the most vulnerable as its economy is hit from two angles with Brexit and supply chain issues. And how do we stop this from happening again? We'll speak with our resident climate expert, Akshat Rati, about the long-term solutions to the power crunch. This is Bloomberg Green. Jennifer Zabasaja in New York, and here's everything you need to know in green this week. The European Union drew record demand for its first ever green bond. The bloc registered more than 135 billion euros in orders for a sale of 12 billion euros of securities maturing in 2037. It was the sector's biggest ever offering, eclipsing last month's debut from the UK. Also, 24 more countries have joined a global pact to reduce methane emissions. With the addition of Canada, France, Germany, and others, nations backing the pledge now represent about 30 percent of global methane output. Methane is one of the most powerful greenhouse gases with more than 80 times the warming impact of carbon dioxide over the short term. And finally, Qatar, the world's biggest exporter of liquefied natural gas, says it would be wrong to commit to eliminating CO2 emissions without having a proper plan in place. Qatar's energy minister says that natural gas, a cleaner fuel than oil or coal, would 
would remain crucial to the global economy for decades. The UAE this month became the first of the Persian Gulf nation to commit to zeroing out emissions within its borders, saying it would invest almost $165 billion in clean energy by 2050. And that's your Green Brief. Kaylee? Thanks, Jen. Few places in Europe have felt the energy crunch as hard as the United Kingdom. Its isolation from the continent, both literally and as a result of Brexit, has exacerbated gaps in the supply chain. And as prices rise from suppliers, the British government has said that it won't support utility companies. The government will not bail out uh, failed companies. There cannot be a reward for um, irresponsible management of, of businesses. Already, 10 companies have been allowed to fail, with their 1.7 million customers reallocated to other suppliers. And if the situation worsens further, the government may be forced to act. The UK's traditional big six utilities have faced competition in recent years from all renewable upstarts. But with wind production down this year and a smaller client base, will they be more at risk of rising prices? Dale Vince, Ecotricity CEO and founder, joins us now to discuss. Ecotricity is a green utility that serves around 200,000 customers around the country with a large portfolio on wind power. Dale, it's great to talk to you about this crisis in particular. First off, how are you coping? Yeah, we're coping okay uh, because we bought our power and gas in advance and the companies that have exited the market is 12 now, by the way, and nearly 2 million customers affected. Uh, most of them didn't do that, and so they've been caught out by the sudden spike in wholesale prices. But they've also been caught out by our government. You said at the top of this piece that our government refused to help out. They've done more than that. They're forcing these companies out of business because they've imposed a price cap so they're forcing companies now to sell gas and power for less than they can buy it for, which is forcing them bankrupt. Do you expect that price cap will be lifted in April and how materially? Well, in April, it goes up again. It, it went up a couple of days ago, so it happens twice a year. Mm -hmm. But it does have a, it does a kind of retrospective basis. You know, the October rise, for example, took place a couple of days ago. That was calculated a few months ago based on market prices, not market prices today. So it's incapable of reflecting what's actually happening in the market. Prices will go up again in April, but again, they won't reflect the market at the time. And, and they probably won't be able to undo the damage that's been done in the meantime in the winter. And obviously, you at Ecotricity have a large portfolio of wind power, as I said. There has been a lot of conversation about the role of renewable energy in this crisis and maybe its failures to backstop traditional oil and gas. What are your thoughts on that? I don't think you can point the finger at renewable energy for this crisis. I think um, in terms of our country, our problem is that we're dependent on foreign countries and the global market for our energy supplies, for our oil and gas, and even where we're not. The North Sea, for example, still supplies 50% of the gas to our country, but the price of that gas has gone up fivefold. The price of extracting it hasn't gone up. So there's something fundamentally wrong with our system, and the answer is to get ourselves completely off of fossil fuels, to power the country entirely from renewables, and to control the price of that. The price of renewable energy doesn't actually go up once you've built it. But if we allow this market to continue, this global market in energy, then there will always be fluctuations. We don't have to have them. We can regulate in a different way. Part of the issue with this crisis is we're kind of stuck in this in-between, where we've started the transition to green energy, to renewables, but we're not all the way there yet. What needs to be done to accelerate that transition? Well, we simply need um, more commitment from politicians. You know, in, the, in Britain today, we still spend more money subsidizing fossil fuels than we do renewable energy. And we need to transition that. One other point just to make is that renewable energy can democratize the global energy scene because every country in the world has access to enough wind or sun to power themselves completely. This is not true of fossil fuels. It drives conflict. It's created this awful energy market, which which price spikes all of the time. You know, the price of fossil fuels fluctuate uh, incredibly. It's controlled, uh, rigged really by OPEC quite openly. And, you know, there are a whole army of traders out there that simply make money from volatility. Mm -hmm. But this, this volatility affects economies and companies and people around the world. Yeah, and certainly people around the world are feeling this crisis in particular. You were talking about the price cap earlier and kind of the role of the UK government here. What else would you like to see the government do to ensure that there is adequate supply for consumers as we head into the winter? 
I think it makes no sense to have a, a retail price cap, but not a wholesale one. So as I say, North Sea coming into our country, North Sea gas is currently costing five times as much to buy, uh, but the retail price has been fixed. I think the cap should come away. It doesn't make any sense. Um, there's a lot of government tax on our electricity bills. Uh, about 25% of everybody's electricity bill is a government tax of some shape or form. That should come off. Um, and that would help lower bills. And of course, we just have to get on and, and build more renewable energy very quickly, take the subsidies away from fossil fuels, change the planning system, which currently is in favor of fossil fuel power stations and against onshore wind, for example, and solar. Just then basically change our economic approach to energy. If the government doesn't act in the way that you'd like it to, will eco ecotricity be able to survive? Yes. All right, we'll leave it at that. Thank you so much to Dale Vince. Valuable insight as we see the UK going through this energy crisis. He is founder and CEO of Ecotricity. Now let's look further into the impact the surge in energy cost is having on UK consumers. It's a twofold hit for the poorest households as the spike has come just as two pandemic era safety net programs have ended. For low support for wages and a temporary increase in benefits pumped almost 80 billion pounds into the economy, softening the blow from successive lockdowns. For more, let's get to Bloomberg's UK economics reporter, Lizzie Burden. At the Tory party conference in Manchester, the UK Prime Minister gave his speech on levelling up Britain, improving productivity and seeing higher wages. We are embarking now on a change of direction that has been long overdue. But he glossed over the economic challenges facing the public. Simon, a driver from Manchester, tells me that Boris Johnson is out of touch with the rest of the country. You know, there's a fuel crisis, there's an electricity and gas crisis at the moment. Inflation's going to be soaring in the next couple of months, so, so just completely paint over it. It's just crazy. Well, I think it's ridiculous that they're here in Manchester as well, and they're just rubbing it in the noses of all the, the Labour supporters up here. Um, like I said, there's a fuel crisis at the moment, you know, there's a £20 benefit being cut for the poorest people in the UK, and they're saying just to, get, to tell people to get more jobs, and, you know, because immigration's slowing down now, so just fill those people's jobs, and that's just not going to happen. And it's no surprise that he's not mentioned it at all. You know, everybody's been impacted at the moment with energy, with fuel, with benefits being cut, and it's just affecting absolutely everybody, apart from the rich, unfortunately. I also spoke to Helen Barnard from the Joseph Roundtree Foundation. Well, I think it's extraordinary that the Prime Minister could go on stage and give a speech, talk about levelling up, and not have anything to say to the five and a half million families who've, whose incomes have just been levelled down by a thousand pounds a year. I spent this morning uh, on the radio listening to people calling in in tears in despair because they don't know how they're going to pay the bills. They don't know how they're going to be able to buy their children a Christmas present. And it's extraordinary the Prime Minister couldn't look them in the eye and acknowledge what they've chosen to do and tell them what his plan is for them to be able to pay their bills. I think there was a real jarring feeling between the despair that families are feeling this morning and the upbeat, optimistic, joke-filled speech. Boris Johnson talked jubilantly at Tory party conference about levelling up Britain, but the surge in energy prices to a record high in September is only set to widen inequalities. That's because low-income households spend proportionately more than the rest of the population on gas and electricity to heat and power their homes. Now, rising energy prices are a global phenomenon, but in the UK, a cap on how much energy providers can raise prices was lifted at the start of October. Now, that's especially painful for the million or so people who were the last left on furlough at the end of the scheme. Their employment prospects are now uncertain. But on top of that, rising energy prices will also bite households who are relying on the temporary £20 a week uplift in universal credit. As you can see, the poorest households are losing the most income as a result of that measure ending. They're set to be off about £1,000 a year worse. Now, what does that look like day to day? Campaign groups say that a million households will have to rely on extra blankets to keep warm and more people will struggle to afford to eat. So all eyes are on the Chancellor's budget on October the 27th. Unless he announces new policies to address the cost of living crisis, the government risks being perceived as tone deaf to the economic realities facing Britain. Kayleigh? That was Lizzie Burden there with a look at the unequal impact of the energy crunch. From the blame game to the solutions game. Up next, we break down how to fix the energy crisis and smooth out the transition to clean energy with our resident climate expert, Akshat Rati. This is Bloomberg Green.
we're, we're under strong pressure, but this is why we have to first have short-term answers at a national and European level. It is a serious issue. I think we have to be very clear that the gas prices are skyrocketing. We ask is for a, an innovative solutions and also very determined solutions uh, uh, from the Commission. So we have to change some regulations, otherwise everybody will suffer. I think he is really overstating the issue of the energy transition. These re the energy prices are, are, are damaging. They're damaging our economies. They're, they're really harsh for our, uh, for our population. We have to build our capacity to be less dependent. The strategic reserve, which can be used to kind of um, moderate the fluctuations in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in prices. From Bloomberg's world headquarters in New York, I'm Kaby Limes, and this is Bloomberg Green. So far, we've discussed what's behind the energy crisis, but what about the solutions? Joining us now is our resident green expert, Akshat Rati. So Akshat, let's think about the short term first. How do we work our way out of the current crisis? In the short term, I'm afraid we're going to have to pay the prices that fossil fuels are going to demand because supplies of natural gas and coal are running short. And there are a multiple set of reasons behind it. We've had a huge increase in demand because of the pandemic lockdowns being lifted. Uh, we've had lower supply of gas, both in piped uh, gas from Russia to Europe, for example, and lower levels of liquefied natural gas in the system. And last winter, especially here in Europe, was colder, which means the storage levels are running lower than historical uh, levels. So we're going to have to pay and uh, find a way out of that through this winter. So let's talk about the role of climate policy. How was that a contributing factor to this crisis? So climate policy gives you two levers. For example, here in Europe, there's a carbon price, uh, which is applied for when you use fossil fuels for either power generation or an industry. And that is an, a disincentive to use those fossil fuels. Now, carbon price has been rising for the past year. It's almost doubled in the past year. And that was one reason why electricity prices were rising. Uh, the second thing that climate policy can do is add more renewables to the grid because of uh, government mandates that want cleaner electricity in the grid. Now, what we can see is that carbon prices have kind of leveled off uh, in recent months. And yet, electricity prices keep rising. And that's because most of the contribution for that rise is tied to natural gas prices. So climate policy contributes a little bit, but not so much. All right, so let's look out over the longer term horizon. How could the global energy transition affect future crises? So we know that the electricity system is one of the uh, weirdest energy systems in that you have to supply for demand instantaneously. Uh, there isn't as much storage in the system. It's not like oil tankers where you can ship oil tankers uh, and, and they can reach where demand is needed. So what we're going to need to do if we are to hit net zero, which is what lots of governments are now planning to, is add batteries uh, to the mix. And as we can see from this chart from Bloomberg NEF, that battery prices have been falling and we should be able to put more batteries on the grid. The other thing we can do, and that's probably a longer term solution, is add green hydrogen, where you take water, you split it up, and you store energy in the form of hydrogen, which then you can burn uh, or use in a fuel cell to bring back electricity. Thanks to our resident climate expert, Akshat Rati. So consumers may have to deal with high prices for a while, but there are plenty of solutions to smooth over the clean energy transition. That's it for this week's edition, but keep the conversation going. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and on YouTube. I'm Kaylee Lines from Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York, and this is Bloomberg Green.